you guys are freaking me out. Just, I did almost all of my teaching in middle school, and I've never had a room full of people just waiting. <laughs> this is really weird. I think everybody's supposed to hang around in the hall until I start talking, and then I'll run back in really quickly before the bell stops ringing. I'm going to start it. People can wander in or out or whatever you guys want to do. Um, new tricks for old dogs, extending computer life. My name is John Schenker. I'm the technology coordinator for the Brexville Broadview Heights Schools up in Cuyahoga County. I've been there for about 10 years. Before that, I was a middle school teacher, taught computer applications in a couple different school districts. All of my stuff is at tasteoftech.net. That's my blog. That's where links to everything are. I have handouts. I spent hours on the handouts. It just has that on it. If you want to pick one up on your way out, be my guest. If not, I'll bring them back next year and hand them out again. All of the links and all of the things I'm talking about are also tagged in Delicious using the, the tag etechohio09. So if you go to delicious.com, my username is jshanker. That's all of my bookmarks. And then the stuff specifically for this presentation, etechohio09. Lots of people at the conference are starting to use that for their presentations. So if you just go to Delicious and you search for eTech Ohio 09, you should find lots of links from lots of people presenting on a lot of different topics here at the conference. Uh, it's one way to aggregate uh, a lot of that content together. I also do a weekly webcast on EdTech Talk. Every Sunday night, we do a roundup of news and resources in education and technology. It's a conversation among four people including myself and somebody in New Hampshire and somebody in Canada and somebody in New Jersey. And we talk about educational technology for about 45 minutes or an hour every Sunday night at 7. And there's live interactive chat room. And we Skype people in. And, and uh, so if you're interested, it's also a podcast. Uh, that's at edtechtalk.com. This presentation is done in Prezi, which is an online presentation making program thing. Uh, it's in beta. Uh, you probably haven't seen other people using it here at the conference. You can sign up at Prezi.com if you're interested in, in that kind of thing and email them or send them a, a message saying why you want to use this program and they'll uh, send you a code that allows you to log in and use it. Okay? Uh, so far it's free. Uh, it's very beta. There are some things about it that I don't really like, um, but it's a different way to do a presentation. So that's what I'm using here. Some people at this conference are bragging about how many slides they're using in their presentations, you know, like setting a school net record for 5 million slides. I'm using one. That's it. Uh, we're just, just zooming around on that one slide. I want to talk about Macs uh, for a minute. This presentation doesn't really cover the Mac at all. Okay? I, I work in a district that is standardized on the Intel platform and has been for quite a while. And we don't use Macs in our district. Uh, that doesn't mean that none of this stuff applies to the Macintosh. It just means that uh, if it does, it's kind of by accident. You really don't want me to talk about the Mac. I don't do anything with a lowercase i at the front. And the last time I used Macs, that's what their logo looked like. So you don't really want me to act like an expert on anything to do with Apple. Let's start with some good news. Most of the data in these charts that I'm going to show you come from the Biennial Educational Technology Assessment. Every year, every teacher in Ohio, or every other year, every teacher in Ohio has to do a survey online saying how they use technology. And we've been doing that every other year since the dawn of time. And so we have data now about these things, except that it's not accessible on eText websites. So I couldn't give you statewide data. This is just our data. Um, but basically, Teachers' attitudes toward technology have improved over the last couple of years. Teachers are now saying that computers are a more effective tool, that they uh, help them in their work, that they make in learning more interesting for their students, that generally teachers' attitudes toward using technology in the classroom have improved over the last couple of years. The red lines are the 2007 survey. The yellow lines are the 2005 survey. Okay? Looking at how teachers use technology, these are teachers this is teachers' use of technology where they use that technology at least once a month. And in every case, they've gone up over the two-year period between 2005 and 2007. Teachers are using technology more. It sometimes seems like we're banging our heads against the wall, you know, trying to teach teachers how to print to that printer or how to you know, open an email attachment for the 400th time. They're using technology more now than they've ever been using it before. And that's a good thing. Um, 
Student use of technology has also increased, especially their use of the internet. Uh, there are a couple things that we're going to talk about later here uh, where technology use has actually gone down in specifically spreadsheets and desktop publishing. They're doing more presentations. They're doing more um, internet stuff with uh, computers. In addition, the computers available to students in the classroom have increased over the last few years. The, these are numbers that the teachers reported in terms of how many computers are available to students in your classroom. And those numbers, these are computers per student, and we're still horrible. I mean, we're still at, at 1.6 instead of 1.4, but we're making progress. We are making technology increasingly available to students in the classroom, okay? And, and we're making progress there. Bad news. Percent of students who do not have access. This is teachers saying that I would like to do this with my students, but they don't have access to the technology to do it. Okay? Increases between 2005 and 2007. So teachers are saying, I would love to use spreadsheets in my class, but we don't have access to spreadsheets in my class. Which is odd because in every computer in my district that has a word processor also has a spreadsheet. Um, but the perception, at least, is that students, they don't have access to, you, to the technology to do these things. And that has increased. So teachers' frustration level with the availability of technology in their classes has increased. And teachers are saying that technology is not as available for their students as it used to be, even though there's more of it. Okay? We're at the point where the demand for technology, the demand for access to these kinds of tools is increasing a lot faster than we can keep pace with it. Now, I thought we were doing a pretty good job in our district of kind of keeping up with things and, and replacing things on a schedule instead of, you know, waiting until, well, it dies and, and it's 15 years old and we're trying to, to tell teachers that they still should be using, you know, Claris Works 2 or whatever. Uh, increasingly frustrated. Ugly news, this is stuff you all know. Unemployment rates. Um, the red line is the U.S., the yellow line is Ohio. Uh, governor said that last week. We lost 100,000 jobs in Ohio in 2008. Okay. This is uh, a Realty Track chart showing foreclosure actions in the United States last year. The West had a really bad time, but look at the Midwest. That's one, in, one to four percent of homes in the Midwest had some kind of foreclosure action in 2008. In Ohio, I think the number's around two and a half percent. This is just December. And you can see that it, it's pretty concentrated in, in uh, the more urban areas in Ohio, that people are having a really hard time economically. Again, from the governor's speech last week. Um, we are at the point where our parents and our community members aren't saying, we don't like what the schools are doing, or we don't value education, or we don't um, think the schools are managing their financial uh, resources in a responsible way. What they're saying is, I'm worried about paying my house payment and I can't afford to vote for a school levy. I can't give you more money than I'm already giving you. Okay? We're losing our jobs, we're losing our houses, we're in really serious financial trouble. Okay? Passage rates, um, predictably, have gone down over the last few years and are going to continue to go down. Um, District funding for technology. In my district, and I didn't realize this until I started looking for this chart, um, our technology funding has been a fairly consistent 0.4% of the district's general fund budget. Okay? If that continues, we're going to see a dramatic decrease in available funding for technology over the next several years. Um, you know, again, we're in a school district where our board is now saying it would be insensitive for us to ask the community for more money at this point. That if we put a, a, you know, a measure on the February ballot or on the May ballot, we're just completely out of touch with the reality if we're, we're expecting the, the voters to, to vote for these things. So that's pushing our request for new money back, and, and we're going to be in trouble for a long time. There's not going to be more resources for a long time. So where does that leave us? Well, that leaves us in a position where we have to do more with less. We have to find ways to leverage existing technologies, existing things that we're doing, uh, keep our stuff around longer, uh, and that's basically what we're going to talk about. There's one thing you can do that works sometimes. This is an IT secret. 
Okay? I expect you all to keep it under your hats. I have done this successfully in my district a couple times. It's not 100%, but it works a lot of the time. If you need to upgrade a computer, there are some cases where you can invest $100 and replace the monitor. Because if you take the CRT monitor off and you put a flat panel monitor on, I've had people bake me brownies because their computer is so fast now. <laughs> Administrative assistants, administrators, curriculum director. There are people that you can do that with, okay? And they're not going to know. And they'll be amazed that you transferred all their data and they didn't lose anything. <laughs> okay. Make you a hero. Uh, EPC, last year, I spent half of the conference looking for one of these things. They're all over the place downstairs, okay? $300 laptop, $350 last year. Uh, we bought some of them because we saw it as... You know, yesterday, Wes Fryer was talking about transformational change. We saw this as a potential transformational device, that for $350, I can have a device that has everything I need on it, or almost everything I need on it. And we're, we're looking at this and comparing it to, not to pick on AlphaSmart, but comparing this to an AlphaSmart and saying, OK, I could have 30 AlphaSmarts, or I could have 20 of these, and these have uh, web browsers, and they have wireless internet, and they have spreadsheets, and they have word processors, and they can print, and they have you know, all kinds of things. So we bought some of those. And I passed them around, gave them to teachers in my district, gave them to uh, some administrators, some students, and said, how can we use these? Does it make sense for us to start using these in our district? And basically what we have here is, you know, it's, if you used, this is another Mac thing. We had at ease last time I used a Mac, right? And it, it looked a lot like this, where you had folders, and you just click on stuff, and it runs the program. It's very easy to use. But you have a web browser, you have an email client, you have wireless networking tools there. There's a full email program, spreadsheets, presentation package, PDF readers, some learning tools which are, are mostly of the drill and practice variety. There's a typing tutor there and a math fact tutor there and, and that kind of thing. Uh, some paint tools. On the play menu, you get things like some games and, and uh, media player and you can listen to music and record music and that sort of thing. Um, and then all of the settings you would expect the computer to have. Teachers loved it. Students loved it. We set up a wiki for them to provide some feedback and, and sort of collaborate on ideas on how we could use these. This little machine is pretty cool. Can't wait to give it to a few third graders. Uh, does most of what we needed to do. So, you know, they were generally really positive about how we could be using these in the classroom. And um, we have an internal technology grant program where teachers can write grants for technology for use in their classrooms. And a teacher wrote a grant for one, uh, a lab of 20 of them, and, and we're using them in sixth grade science. And they're working really well. Uh, they had some criticisms of them. Keyboard is really small. I initially learned to type with one hand and don't have a problem typing with one hand on that. But if I try to use two, it's pretty difficult. Screen requires a lot of scrolling because it's a little tiny screen. Lots, we had some problems with wireless, problems with kids in the touchpad. Ironically, all of these criticisms came from the adults. Kids didn't have any problem with it. You know, I took it home and gave them to my second grader, my fourth grader. They didn't have any problems scrolling around on web pages or using the touchpad or typing on the keyboard. It was the, the building principles that said, we could never use these, really. <clears throat> so I started thinking about the EPC. And I know we don't have money to go out and buy one of those for every kid, even though it may make sense in some cases to do something like that. We're really talking about trying to leverage old technology that we have and, and, and try to make the old technology work in better ways. Basically, this is an EPC. It has a Celeron processor. I swore off Celeron processors because we bought them years ago and they were horrible. Okay, And now we're excited about them. They, they have half a gig of RAM, four gigs of permanent storage. I started thinking about that and comparing it to the computer that's in the classroom already that is off in the corner somewhere with dust all over it that nobody wants to use because it's old and it's slow and uh, could you just get this out of the way so we can put something useful there. Optiplex GX400s we bought in 2001, I think. 1.7 gigahertz processors in them. Pentium 4s, not Celerons, they have less RAM, but they have more storage space. They have much faster processors. So why are people trying to get rid of these and trying to get these instead? What can we do that will take the technology that, that makes this really attractive to them 
and apply that to a desktop machine. We started looking for solutions to do that. Now portability, we knew we weren't gonna, gonna come up with because they're not gonna carry that thing around. But other than that, we have full-size keyboards, we have full-size screens, we have CD-ROM drives. We, we overcame many of those limitations that they were saying about the EPC. We just need to find a way that we can make those old computers act more like these computers. First thing we found was a, an operating system called Limpus Lite. And Limpus Lite is used on some of the little laptops. It's free open source software. Basically, it's a light version of the operating system running Linux. Looks a lot like that. That one's called Xandros. It's proprietary. You have to pay for it to use it. That one's free. Okay. So we started looking at this. It basically runs a lot of the same applications as the EPC. It has a web browser on it. It has all of the office productivity tools on it. It has things like the music players and, and a photo manager and, and some games there has a full, fully functioning web browser, okay? There's Office Productivity Suite, it runs OpenOffice, so you can use the word processors there, you can use the spreadsheets, you can do graphs, you can do presentations with it. Uh, has a paint program. My kids like Tux Paint better than they like Kid Picks. It, it, it's not a bad little drawing program. The problems that we found with Olympus were that we had some hardware issues with the specific computers we were trying to run it on. When we tried to install it, it's like that video driver wouldn't work. Or, you know, you, it would work, but the screen would be huge because the resolution was really bad. So we, we had some issues initially, and we just kind of kept looking. I've since gone back and looked at Limpus, and I think we're going to take another look at it and, and because it, it has come a long way since that initial evaluation. But we, had, we didn't end up deploying that everywhere. Another option that we looked at was GOS. You may remember that Walmart a couple years ago came out with really cheap computers, $200 computers that they were selling made by Everex in, in the Walmart stores, and they had Linux on them. You know, Walmart selling out of them and talking about how wonderful these things are. Basically, they were running GOS. Uh, the G apparently stands for good, good operating system. It's a net-based OS. Okay, if you look at the bottom, I'm told that's how the Mac works now where you, you mouse over those things on the bottom and they get bigger and you click on them. Um, those are icons that, that have links to online tools. So they're things like uh, Google Docs and Blogger and Flickr and YouTube and, and all kinds of different applications there. It also has the open office tools over there. It also has a Firefox browser. And then everything on the desktop is a widget. You can have, you know, that calendar is a Google calendar. And over there on the right, that's an RSS feed in the, the, uh, the thing in the middle there is a, a little weather widget. And you can move those things around and reconfigure them and add new ones. Basically, this takes the operating system and moves it to the cloud. You know, most of the applications are now running in your browser. You're not running, installing an Office productivity suite on the computer and using that. You're using Google Docs, okay? You're not uh, using the computer for most of the applications. You're using online applications. We weren't ready for that. Okay. We're a district that doesn't give email accounts to students, and we're not ready for like documents out in the cloud and, and letting go of all of those strings yet. There's still, there's still some work for us to do on the policy side and, and on uh, like changing people's minds about how information is stored and, and accessed and, and shared. So we weren't ready to do that yet, but uh, it, it's a very good alternative. We also looked at something called Linux Terminal Server Project. They're doing demos downstairs on this. The idea here is that you run a server on the back end, and all of these computers, these old computers, end up booting from the network. So they, they boot up and say, I need an operating system, and it goes out to this server and gets that operating system. So all of the, the processing is done on the terminal server. The advantage to doing that is that you can run really low-end hardware um, on the desktop and make that work, okay? That it runs everything on the terminal server instead of on the computers themselves. Um, we did a pilot with that, and what we found was that, first of all, you have to have a server, and we, weren't, we were trying to find a, a free solution, not something that you have to go out and spend $4,000 to use your, uh, your existing hardware. The other thing that we found is that, in general, my district was not ready to run Linux on the desktop, and all of these solutions are Linux-based, because they have applications that required Windows. Okay? We're running SuccessMaker version 
one or something, something we've had forever, has to work on those computers. We have to run Accelerated Reader on those computers. We have to run, and they, they just had this list of stuff, this, this keyboarding program. It's not that we're teaching keyboarding, it's that we have to use this program, only works in Windows. So they weren't ready for, Win for Linux yet. You know, and actually, Walmart ended up pulling out of that program that they're not selling, at least in the, in the retail stores, they're not selling Linux-based computers. I tried running Ubuntu as my primary OS last year for a month, and it nearly drove me crazy. So maybe you have people in your district who have strong opinions about which OS you're running. Maybe you have a board member who has a strong opinion about it, or maybe you have an alumnus who has you know, really strong feelings about the OS you're running. Disclaimer, neither of those are affiliated with my district at all. You get these arguments, everybody's using Windows, I have to run Windows, you know. They're the programs that we use only work in Windows. Students have Windows at home and we want to run the same thing at school. We want to stay standardized on one platform. Most of these things have come out of my mouth at some point. It's what they use in the real world. You know, for whatever reason, you may be in a situation where you're not ready to bail on the OS entirely. You want to continue to run Windows, but you just need to find a better way to do it. We looked at this program called End Computing. Actually, it's hardware and software. They're downstairs. They're right when you walk in, I think. The idea there is similar to Terminal Server, except that you're taking one pretty good beefy computer here that you would have like a new computer in your classroom, and then you're connecting keyboards and mice and monitors to it so that you can run four computers or four students using the same computer at the same time. Okay, uh, software-based solution and, and hardware-based solution where you just connect everything to that one computer. The idea is the computer spends most of its time just kind of sitting there and so waiting for, for the user to do something. So uh, if you can leverage that, those extra processing cycles and have multiple people using the same computer, you can do that relatively inexpensively. And so we started looking at this. We got a couple of them in. We started using them in classrooms. And then Mark Bornhorst posted on the, the tech coordinators listserv about licensing for this. Um, this was, was in October. Basically, he was wondering about licensing. He got a joint communique from the end computing people and Microsoft saying, what do we need to do from a licensing perspective to make this work? And basically, th these were the things that they came up with. The host computer, the one that you're running all of this off of, needs to be running Windows Server 2003 or 2008. You can't just run Windows you have to run the server version of Windows. Okay? For each of the end computing devices, each of these monitors that you're connecting to it, you have to have a student device client access license, and you have to have a terminal server client access license. And if you're running Microsoft Office, you have to have a Microsoft Office license. So we started looking at this solution, and then the hardware piece is about 200 bucks. So you have $300 in software, $200 in hardware, a reasonably powered host computer, and then monitors, keyboards, and mice, and you're not even using your old computers. So we looked at that and said, yeah, that might have some applications for us, but if we're going to do this legally, it probably doesn't make sense financially if we can find an, another way around it. Okay? That's not saying that, that the end computing devices are bad or that they don't work well. They actually worked fairly well for us, um, but overcoming those limitations was, was kind of big for us. So we're stuck with Windows, running Windows on each computer. And looking for solutions of ways to uh, make that a little bit better. When I started running Windows, um, on my first computer, it came with Windows 3.0. I had an 80 meg hard drive. I kept deleting Windows because it was taking half of that. It was 40 megs and I didn't, I'd want to run something else and I wouldn't have room for it, so I'd delete Windows and then run this other program and then get tired of that and reinstall Windows. And you know, Windows on this laptop's taking three and a half gigs out of you know, and, and as time has gone on, Windows has, shall we say, put on a little weight. That there are a lot of things in Windows that we don't need to do, but they're installed by default and they're part of the operating system and we're kind of stuck with them. We found this application called Nlight. And the concept of Nlight is to take a Windows installation and remove all the stuff you don't need because you're really focusing on trying to get a few key features into your operating system, and we don't need all of the stuff that's in there. There's a version of this for XP. There's also a version for Vista. Okay? Basically, you, you install the program, and you run the, the program, and it says, 
where's your Windows CD? So you pop the CD in and say, here's the Windows CD. And it says, okay, I'm going to make a copy of that. So it copies it to your hard drive, the Windows CD. And it copies and copies and copies. And then it, it gives you a whole bunch of options. This is really useful if you have, like, a Service Pack 1 OS CD and you want, you know, because you install that and then you spend four days doing all the updates to it, you can actually slipstream all of the updates into the OS CD so that they're, they're done as you install it. You can also add specific drivers. You know, every computer in the district has to print to this copier and the drivers for that are never on the machine, so I have to have the CD and it's a big pain. You can actually add all that stuff to it. We're going to focus on the other, the other part of that which is removing components from Windows. So basically, you select out of this menu the stuff that you want to do at the bottom. We're going we're to create a bootable ISO out of this. And it says, okay, what is it that you really need to do with this computer? And you just check the stuff I have to be able to use a camera with it, or I need to be able to print. I want to be able to access Windows Update. And you check that stuff, and then as you go through this customizing it, if you accidentally remove something that you need to do one of those, it warns you about it and says, um, if you do this, you know the internet's not going to work. And so you can, you can fix that. Basically, you get a whole bunch of options of stuff that you want to remove from your Windows installation. Okay? You can take the games out. You can take the pinball game out. You can take ATM support out, because I doubt you're using ATM support at the desktop, even if you're doing video conferencing stuff. You know, do you need support for a tape drive? Do you need support for, you know, brother fax machines? Do you need all those keyboard layouts? Probably not. Do you need all those languages? Um, you know, you could probably remove Armenian. <laughs> you know, and then, and then some of the, the more resource intensive things, okay? You, you can take out things like Movie Maker, because if, you know, if you're going to use Movie Maker in your classroom, you're going to use the computer that you have that's like three years old and not the one that's seven years old, okay? There are some things that you're not going to be doing with these old machines. You can take out the 500 mouse cursors that are available. Um, so all of this stuff, you just go through and it gives you all the options. On the right side, it tells you what each thing does and, and what happens if you remove it and what it's going to break and what you're not going to be able to do afterwards. Then the next section, you can customize some things in your Windows installation. If you want to move your profiles somewhere else by default or uh, you know, change the compression levels. Or, you know, when you boot from a Windows install CD, it says press any key to boot from the CD, and if you don't, it boots from the hard drive and you have to do it. You can turn that off, okay? You can also pre-enter your product key. If you have uh, an open license for, for Windows, you can put the product key in, then you don't have to type it in. Um, you can change a lot of, of the default settings in Windows that are gonna be there after it installs. Basically, you do all of this stuff and you say, okay, I'm done, let's start the process, and it goes through this copy of your Windows installation, and it removes all the stuff that you told it to remove, it fixes all the things that you told it to fix, it changes all the settings that you specified, and it eventually finishes, you know, in this case, with the options I selected, it reduced it from 403 megs to 205, okay? Then it says, okay, stick in a CD and I'll burn this as an ISO for you, or you create an ISO, or it'll, it'll burn the, the CD for you, and you end up with a Windows installation CD. Okay? You install Windows, you have a light version of Windows that just has the stuff you specified on it. We tried this in a couple places. Classroom computers that we had pulled out or that we had replaced, we left the computers in the classroom or we pulled them, so we had little groups of them. These are computers that the teachers couldn't wait to get rid of because they were so old and slow and pathetic. We put in light images on them. They run as well as the new machines do. Okay. We took a lab out, replaced the lab, had these old computers, put them in another room, and that room is now another lab that gets as much use as, as the first one does. Okay. A couple other things that we, we did while we were doing this. One of them is thinking about which, operate, or which versions of software we need to run. Okay. I know Windows 7 has, or uh, Office 7, Office 2007, has a lot of really cool features that everybody wants to use in it. I know that Office 2003 has that and Office 2002 has that. I don't use any of them, okay? I could get by with 97 if I had to, but I really, generally, 2000 has everything I need, okay? So 
if succeeding versions of Office use more RAM and use more disk space and use more processing resources and operate more slowly, what's wrong with using 2000? We installed Office 2000 everywhere that we, we used Enlite. We have had one problem, and that problem is with publisher files. So we tell people if you're using publisher, use the old ones or use the new ones, but don't go back and forth. Word hasn't been a problem. PowerPoint hasn't been a problem. Excel hasn't been a problem. So we, we've been downgrading Office just to, to try to, to make it run better. We've also used alternatives for a lot of the plugins. Two things here, one is a QuickTime alternative and the other is real alternative. First, we, we always seem to need QuickTime for something or we need real player for something even though we have issues with real player and we reluctantly end up installing it every time because somebody needs it for some website. These are alternatives that don't <coughs> nag you to upgrade them every time you run them, that don't have this huge memory footprint, that don't take forever to load. They're alternatives to handle those different media types. They're, they're relatively lightweight. They install quickly and easily. They don't need updated all the time. They work really well. We also use Foxit Reader everywhere. I hate Adobe Reader because pops up that splash screen every time I open a PDF and then I go get coffee while it finishes loading and then it says, I think there's a new version you need to upgrade. Foxit Reader we use everywhere that we use PDFs. Have not had any issues with it in terms of compatibility with Adobe Reader or at least, at least the free version of Adobe Reader. It supports looking at, at PDF files from the desktop. It supports like when you click on them on the internet, they just open up. It supports tabbed PDF files, which is kind of interesting because then you can have multiple ones open instead of all these windows all over the place. Uh, really good, free. Couple suggestions if you're gonna do stuff like this. You know, some things that uh, we've encountered as we've been going through this that, that may be of, of use to you. One is to listen to your users and to try to figure out what it is they're trying to do. As tech people, we tend to focus on what we can do instead of what they need to do. You know, back here on this graph, look at the stuff that's tall. Okay? What are they actually trying to do with these computers? They're doing word processing, they need internet access, and you know, at least in my district, we still do a lot of drill and practice. Almost all of that drill and practice software is old software that we've had for years and years and years. Okay? We don't need to have really powerful computers to do all of those things. Focus on what's most important. You know, what is it that you're trying to accomplish with your technology? If you're trying to teach kids how to make graphs, it doesn't matter which version of Excel you're using. Okay? Um, if the, the focus is to teach word processing skills, it doesn't matter what the word processor is. You know, a lot of times you get that argument that we need to use the same thing here that they're using at home or that they're using in the business world. But you know, we teach all of these skills in middle school. So by the time the kids get out of high school, even if we're using the latest version of everything, by the time they get to college, let alone get out of college and get into the real world, we're several versions later. They're going to need to adapt to different, different technologies. So we're teaching the skills. We're not teaching the applications. Set limits. One of the things we found is that every computer doesn't have to do everything. We have computers for graphic arts. We have computers for CAD. Those computers aren't the ones I'm talking about today. You know, if you can define particular labs or, or particular computers for use in different situations, say, you know what, we're teaching keyboarding. We don't need powerful computers to teach keyboarding, but we're going to teach keyboarding on these old computers so that we can free these other ones up so that they can do, you know, video editing on them or, or learning, uh, you know, Photoshop or whatever. So if you can set limits on how the computers are going to be used and what the expectations for what that computer needs to do ahead of time, it's going to save you a lot of time. The other thing is to test. Um, <laughs> I sent out a message on Twitter about which picture I should use, and they all picked the other one, but I like that one better. The other one was a picture of a, a sign on the interstate where it, you know, the traffic signs, and it just said, testing the sign. You're talking about changing stuff in the operating system, especially with Enlight, that everybody expects to be there. As a software developer, there are certain things in Windows that are just supposed to be there. And they will make assumptions about those things. And if they're not there, that's going to create problems for you. So what we found with Enlight is it took a few tries that we had to, we created an image and we put it in the lab or we put it in the classroom and we gave it to the teachers and, and the students and said, use this for a couple weeks and let me know what breaks. You know, we think we've got it nailed down. And they would come up, you know, we went to PBS org and we clicked on this link and we went here and this didn't work. And then we have to figure out what that is and what we need for that. So it's a, it's a process of trial and error, but 
but it was one that was very valuable by spending some extra time up front so that once we had the image that we needed, we could then apply that to a lot of computers district-wide. Okay, that's all I have. What do you want to talk about? Doesn't the fact that you're customizing <clears throat> the way you are, um, you know, does that drive up the um, you know, support time that you or staff, I don't know how many people. I have two. Two? Yeah. Couldn't that drive up that, that, that um, cost? It did initially when we're testing them, uh -huh. but it can if you have people coming in and saying, okay, I need to connect a scanner to this now, you know, because that will create some problems un undoubtedly. What we found is that if we can nail all that stuff down ahead of time and say, what, what do you have to do, that that's not really too much of a problem. So the planning? Planning ahead is really important. What was your Kodak gone? The Kodak gone, did you just, was that a website? Or? Yeah, if you just search for real alternative. Real alternative? Yeah, or um, quick time alternative, you'll find them. Just a comment, I, I put only part of it. Are you aware of VLC Media Player? Yes, we use it all over the place. Okay, yeah. I, I, when you talked about Codex, you didn't bring that up. Yeah. I was thinking that that fixes most of them. Good. Yeah. I feel with him. I got a question. Oh, I was just listening. Uh, we were wondering uh, how large your district was. Uh, we have six buildings, about 47, 4,800 students. Okay. How many computers you got in the district? Probably 14 to 1,600, depending on how you count them. You got about 7,000, I guess. So. Huge then. Take yeah. the public, yeah. Oh yeah, that would be. Yeah, we're looking at recycling them, but we run into the same the same issues with people don't want to change, they don't want to run a light version or so nice go nice slide. Slide. One slide. That's half a percent of his presentation. <laughs> What's the cost on the uh, like the uh, G O S? Free. That's free? Yep. Yeah. How about the um, the uh, end line? Free. Really? Yeah. Wow. Everything is free except the, the hardware stuff. The end, the end computing thing is a couple hundred dollars, and the EPC is 250 or 300 now. But yeah, end light is free. Uh, oh, this is free. Thanks. Thanks, guys. Ghost. Ghost. Yep. Ghost. Yep. Which works so we don't mess with it. Bring you know? it down from the network. Uh, boot disk, or do you put it all on the, is it all on a, a disk? We're playing with flash drives with that, but for the most part, we're pulling it down off, off the network using Ghostcast. What we found with flash drives, we just started, like, last week. I bought some flash drives and said, stick Ghost on there and an image so I can hand that to a computer lab aide and she can image her own machines. It takes forever just to pull an image off the flash drives. So, yeah. All right. Good. What's your experience with the Ubuntu? I found, and I was, I was so very, I was very, Thank you very much. selfish about it, saying this is my computer and what I need to do. This is my pain threshold, you know, and and I had a list of stuff that I had to, to be able to do, and I couldn't do them all. Um, but there were things in there like syncing with palms, you know, and using. Uh, I I do some webcasting and stuff, so I had some audio problems, I had problems with webcams, you know, that kind of stuff. It works okay um, for, for that kind of, the low end stuff. Student computers, you wouldn't need that stuff. Um, you will have problems running Windows applications, you know, if you're trying to run it through Wine, you know, to emulate a Windows machine, which is where we ended up with that when we were doing the, the uh, terminal server project. It was okay, but we need to run this keyboarding application and it needs to run on the network and thinks it's running on Windows and it just didn't work. Um, so that's where we sort of bailed on that. But it, in the right application, it, I haven't given up entirely on Ubuntu or Edge Ubuntu. Ooh, we've got a lot of old Macs. And that's not considering just putting Ubuntu on them, using the terminal server. I, yeah, I would talk to, to the Linux terminal server people downstairs. Ryan Collins at Kenton is running terminal server, Linux terminal server on IMAX, like slot load IMAX and tray load IMAX. And yeah. yeah. They're fine. Just uninstalled everything on there. So that might be a good option for you.
Thank you. Did you use that mic at the middle school or high school? I just gave it to my tech team and said play with this. And, and they're teachers from all over, but we didn't really have students using it very much because we don't let them access any of the tools at the bottom. They're not allowed to get to YouTube. They're not allowed to go to Flickr. They're not allowed to go to Google Docs. They're not allowed to go to Gmail. So we just said, we're not ready for that. Yeah. Yep. Does that, does that one assume that you already have a Windows operating system? No. No, it's a so boot CD. Light does, and light does, yes. Okay. Yeah. It's a boot CD. You create an ISO or you download an ISO and create a boot disk. I think you can boot from a flash drive too. I, I have do, to talk but to it's these not, guys because okay, they're coming you. in and I'm in your way.